What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for that swift news, and it's uh, the WWDC wrap-up episode. We had a whirlwind of a week. Uh, let me start off by giving my quick, by now, their unoriginal thoughts. Although I will say I was probably one of the first person to, to tweet the praise for this new video format. But anyway, uh, I loved it. Um, I loved getting all the videos, all not all the videos, but for the day, all the videos all at once. I loved that some of them were 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 60 minutes. By now you've heard all this, everybody's saying this stuff. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. I also thought it brought the community together uh, because, you know, it wasn't like people can see it live and then everybody that's not there has to wait till the next day to watch the session. Like we all were watching it at the same time, learning together. That was great. That being said, there, there is something very special about a ton of developers converging onto one city, even though I understand not everybody can do that. But when you finally get to meet these people that you've been interacting with on Twitter over the years, like that's there's something special about that. So I do hope going forward that a lot of it stays this way, but I hope Apple finds some way to get that magic sounds so cheesy, but that magic of like all the developers being in one city and just the, the we get to meet people. So that's my quick thoughts. Again, by now those are unoriginal, but still wanted to share. All right, before I put up the rundown, I do want to say today is the last day to get 40% off all my courses at seanallen.teachable.com. Uh, so if you're watching this on Tuesday, June 30th or later, sorry, but if you are watching this day one when Swift News comes out, today is the last day to capitalize on that. All right, let's throw up the rundown and we'll get into the news. So I want to start off by sharing the sessions real quick for those that weren't following fanatically. And if you weren't following fanatically all week, that's perfectly fine. You have plenty of time to learn this stuff, learn at your own pace. But here you go. I'll link to the description over 100 video sessions from this year's conference. Right. And now that they're all released, Apple has been able to kind of put them into groups. Like here's the must watch sessions. You can kind of see which ones uh, I'm going to kind of scroll through quickly. You can see some of the topics uh, that are available, but you'll see. Uh, there's the recaps. Those are pretty cool this year. Just quick little one to two minute uh, recaps. You're not going to learn anything in those because you can't teach anything in that small time, but it'll give you a, a quick recap. If you want to learn how to do the new widgets, here you go. Here's a code along or a tutorial, uh, building app clips. If you want to learn all about that. So, so anyway, the videos are now grouped Swift the next code 12. So much easier to navigate. Uh, cause when they were being all released at once, it was kind of like a free for all. I had to like search to find the one I want. So anyway, those are the sessions. Uh, again, highly recommend checking them out. Some of them are, as you can see, Visually edit Swift UI views. That's a five minute video. Add custom views and view modifiers. That's 13 minutes. So you can see there's a wide variety of lengths, which again, I just want to reiterate, I love that. Like the videos were as long as they needed to be. And you'll notice in a lot of these sessions, if you watch, uh, a lot of the Apple engineers are, are working on this app called Fruta. Uh, this is the sample app. You can see, note, this sample project was associated uh, with the sessions and it lists, you know, uh, app clips, packages, widget kits, all that stuff. So. This is a project that you can download and kind of play around with and follow along within the sessions. Or if you just want to download it and really see what a Swift UI app built by Apple engineers look like, right? A lot of times in the community, we discuss styling or conventions and all that stuff. Well, uh, here's a Swift UI built by Apple. So probably a pretty good resource. Next, I want to talk about some overall sites that are collecting a lot of uh, articles because, of course, like you just saw, 100 plus sessions. There's so much to talk about. I can't talk about them all on this episode. This will be three hours long. But there are some sites out there that are kind of collecting a lot of articles. Uh, first one is WWDC by Sindel and Friends. So this is John and a, a few other people uh, that put together articles, myself included. I shared my uh, What's New in Xcode 12 article on here. But if you want to hear uh, some opinions from a handful of developers about the topics and also podcasts, uh, they were releasing a bunch of stuff day by day as the week went on. So this is a great uh, website to check out if you want to get caught up. Also, Paul Hudson uh, put together this WWDC uh, community uh, repo, which this is also a great repository. Uh, as you can see, everything's organized. Events, meetups, offers. Hey, look at that. Last day. Uh, anyway, summaries, Swift, all the Swift UI articles and videos, all the stuff about UI kit. Again, here's my what's new in Xcode, self promotion. I love it. Uh, Donnie Walls' combined stuff, AR kit. So, all these articles that content creators from the community were putting out around uh, WWDC, here's a great one stop shop for you to kind of check out, you know, improves all the various different topics here. So, great resources there. Let's continue on the Paul Hudson train because he was doing amazing stuff as he does every WWDC. Dude's an animal. What's new in Swift UI for iOS 14? So, as expected, Swift UI was the, the bell of the ball, as I've been saying on Swift News. A lot of new Swift UI stuff, and a lot of the excitement uh, was around Swift UI. So, what Paul did here in this article was uh, well, first of all, he, well, 
what he started doing was putting all these articles together on each topic, right? How to play movies in a video player, sprite kit, uh, you know, new property wrapper stuff, you know, how to use labels uh, and an icon and text side by side. So basically everything new that was announced, you got an article for it. And then what he did was he put together this like hour and a half long video actually like demonstrating it in code you know, because some people like to learn via video, some people like to learn via text. However you learn, Paul's got you covered. But if you want to see everything that's new in Swift uh, UI for iOS 14, here you go. Next up, we have the Apple Design Awards. Here playing on the screen is the 2019 uh, edition if you want to watch that. But the reason I'm sharing, if you scroll up here, uh, the Apple Design Awards for 2020 are coming June 29th. That is today, tonight. So to be honest with you, I'm not sure if it's live streamed or if it's going to be up later. Um, but here's the URL right here. Uh, it'll be here if it is live streamed. Uh, so I'll link to that in the description. But you can see that the, the winners of the past years, Ordia, Flow, uh, Gardens Between, you can see the... Um, you know, the apps if you want to check out who won the Apple Design Award. And it's a, the Apple Design Award is often a, a goal of indie developers or smaller companies to, I don't know, just good recognition from Apple, right? Apple's known very much so for their design. So to be recognized by Apple as one of their best designed apps on the App Store, like that's a huge recognition. So uh, I know if you've been following people in the community, there's a lot of indie developers out there who are hoping to win one this year. So we're all rooting for them. Uh, so it's going to be fun to see who actually wins some Apple Design Awards uh, tonight. One of those indie developers who's been looking for it very openly, by the way, on, on Twitter. He's not shy about uh, saying his desire to win uh, in uh, Apple Design Award. Is That's Jordan Morgan. Featured him a bunch, indie developer of uh, Spensac. But uh, I featured this article because, like I said, a lot of the focus, a lot of the excitement was on Swift UI for WWDC. But, you know, as much as we want the shiny new toy, UI kits in millions and millions of apps, UI kit ain't going anywhere for a long time. Uh, you're going to have to know UIKit. So uh, UIKit got some notable additions in iOS 14. And that's what Jordan talks about in this article. So I'll scroll down to give uh, some highlights here. We got a new date and time picker. However, I believe you get this in Swift UI too. So this isn't quite uh, UIKit exclusive, but this is what the new date picker looks like, right? We're all used to this scroll wheel from, from day one of the iPhone pretty much, right? Uh, now we get this updated date picker. Love it. Uh, color picker, same thing. Let's scroll down. I'm just going to speed through this real quick. We've got the new color picker. Uh, but again, that's not necessarily specific to uh, UIKit, but UI Action got a whole bunch of... Uh, he says the revolution uh, up there. Um, but UI action is this little kind of menu bar when you tap on something. Uh, UI collection view got a, uh, some nice stuff. UI list content view, which is a, a new way to do lists in UI collection view. A lot of people thinking table view is going to be deprecated. Um, the writing's on the wall. People have been saying that for a few years now. There's been a ton of like blog posts and stuff to say, hey, you should be using UI collection view for your table views. You know, it's so much better. Table view is like just an old thing. Uh, a lot of people have been saying this is coming for a while now, for years. And then here with the introduction of, you know, uh, lists and UI collection view, it feels like it's finally happening. So do not be surprised if UI table view is deprecated. Don't get me wrong. That's not happening this year, probably not happening next year, but I, I can see it happening in a couple years. Next up, we got some big app store news here. So this article is kind of like a summary of WWDC. So I'm going to skip most of it because we there's there's one paragraph that matters to us here. But you can read this article. I'll link to it, of course. But really, it's a summary of WWDC. Like, hey, app clips were announced. New Xcode, Big Sur, very high level summary. But we are going to go to, uh, yes, new app store review process. Uh, and it's the third paragraph right here. So this is the big news out of this for us anyway, right? Developers. Additionally, two changes are coming to the app review process and will be implemented this summer. So not far from now. Uh, developers will not only be able to appeal uh, decisions about whether their app violates a given app store review, but it'll also have a mechanism to challenge the guideline itself. Like if the guideline is BS, like challenge the guideline, right? Uh, and second, for apps that are already on the app store, bug fixes are no longer delayed over like a guideline violations, right? They'll let you just fix that bug and let's worry about the guideline violation and that dispute, you know, uh, later, not later, but we'll, we'll worry about that separately. Let's at least get the bug fixed. Um, so I think those are two great additions. Um, you know, developers having more power probably feels like a weird word. It's probably, it's hard to feel like you have power against Apple, right? But um, at least you have the ability to appeal these decisions and also appeal the, the actual guideline itself. 
Moving on to the design portion of the show, uh, we have Max Rudberg here. Well, he just he just deemed it the great unflattening. Uh, Andreas is actually the original uh, tweeter here, but I just love that he termed it the great unflattening, right? Because early iOS, you know, we had skeuomorphism. Everything looked real in 3D, right? Your, the Notes app looked like a real notepad. Uh, and then iOS 7 came along, everything got super flat. No depth, no nothing, super simple. And then now we're going through the great unflattening. Or as you can see, this is a Zeppelin Mac app. Uh, everything is kind of getting you know, a little more 3D, the great unflattening, as he called it. And I, I'm on Mac OS Big Sur here. Uh, so I mean, you can see my, my dock down here. You can see things have a little bit more of a 3D uh, feel to them. So anyway, I thought it was funny. He termed it the, the great unflattening. That's why I wanted to share this. Speaking of design here, we have the annual human interface guideline updates, right? WWDC, iOS 14, iPadOS 14, Mac OS Big Sur, all this new stuff comes with new design stuff. Right, so every WWDC, it's highly recommended that you go back and kind of read through the human interface guidelines. At the very least, do the like the new stuff. For example, if you watched any of the designing or building for iPad sessions, you'll know that sidebars, uh, they're a thing. <laughs> like it's this is like a big thing in the iPad. So sidebars and UI split, view controller, all that stuff. And so reading the human interface guidelines will tell you, you know things to think about when you're building your sidebar, right? Like use a sidebar to organize information at the app level. Whenever possible, let people customize the contents of the sidebar, right? Just tips on how to properly use the sidebar. Because again, the sidebar that you see here in an iPad app, it's gonna be everywhere, it seems like, right? Uh, just another example of this is widgets, right? We're all excited for iOS 14 widgets. So reading the human interface guidelines, Apple will give you some guidelines uh, on how to build proper widgets, right? Here's more information. Uh, you know, focus your widget on one idea. Scrolling down a bit, you can see, you know, avoid creating widgets that does nothing but launch your app, right? You want them to actually be useful. So, you know, I'm not gonna read through all the tips, but there's a bunch of different tips on how to properly build a widget. So that's why reading the human interface guidelines after all these updates uh, is so valuable. I want to kick off AR Corner with this tweet from Josh Carpenter because this was the vibe I was getting while watching all the sessions in, on WWDC is this was just a giant preview for AR, right? Like all the groundwork is getting laid. And, and we I think we kind of know it's going to be Apple glasses, but you know, Josh Carpenter says it well too. App clips seem to plant the seed for possible Apple AR features by enabling apps to be unbundled and discreet, discovered uh, serendipitously, and you know consumed instantly. So app clips, uh, you know, that's that little thing that slides up. Uh, and it can be triggered by a QR code. So if you can imagine you're wearing your glasses, you just look at something, it's an app clip, it pops up in whatever UI is in your glasses, and then you just like tap the side of your glasses twice to confirm and you're done, like all just by looking at something. And, and there's a lot of other stuff which we'll get to here um, about AR. In this article from Roxana, uh, it says a first look at Apple's new augmented reality features. So first let's look at this picture right here, right in front of the ferry building, my old, my old front yard. My apartment was literally like a hundred yards to the left. I, I walked across this path like three times a day. Uh, so anyway, what uh, is coming in Apple AR kit four, if you watch that session, that's when you can really start to see like, oh, you can see what they're doing with this AR stuff. So one of the things that's new is location anchors, which that's why I'm staying on this picture, is you'll be able to place uh, an object like this sculpture of, I don't know what, you, what even to call that, mouse skull, elephant ears, who knows? Um, elephant without a trunk, a skull? Uh, all right, I'm done. Um, but you can place this sculpture, whatever it is, uh, at a specific latitude and longitude. And then anybody that's kind of running that app or however they do it, that walks by that latitude and longitude, will see your, your sculpture or whatever. So you can have location anchors for specific Latin long for your uh, items. Um, the depth API is very, very cool. Again, we're getting this LiDAR stuff there. We have a lot of depth in AR. You'll see more about that uh, in a little bit. Location anchors, I just talked about that. Uh, video textures. They did a cool session on the video textures where they had this bug like running around a tree and like its skin looked like it was a video. I don't know, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, object occlusion, like that that's crazy how that, that bench in the back is an AR object, but it knows that with the depth sensing, right? It knows the couches in front of it. So it's able to hide, you know, what the couch is in front of to make it look even more real and like it belongs in that setting. So I don't know, like I said, I, I love, and the whole reason we do AR Corner on Swift News is to kind of preview the future on what this could be. And I think that future is starting to become uh, more and more clear. But again, there's Roxana. Um, but yeah, check out this article on ARKit4. I also recommend the WWDC session on ARKit4 to kind of really see what they're doing. The, the stuff they're doing with like MapKit and AR is, is pretty crazy too. All right, 
onto the uh, point clouds, right? So when using ARKit uh, 4, by the way, this is about, uh, from Dilmer here. So he says, increasing the size of the point cloud particles really helps in getting a faster view of the scanned area. So what you can do with the LiDAR is scan an area. And if you have smaller point clouds, that means it's going to be more defined and more precise. However, it takes a long time to you know, populate and become precise because again, it's doing a lot more stuff, it's, it's more precise. Uh, however, if you make the point clouds larger, yeah, it's a little more vague, but you can see how fast he's moving his iPad around and it's basically modeling the environment that he's in because the point clouds are larger. Um, so basically the whole point of this tweet is like, hey, if you make the point clouds large, you can whip this camera around and it's gonna build the environment pretty quickly. It may not be 1000% accurate, but you can see you get a pretty good idea very, very quickly. Uh, so I wanted to share that. And then, of course, I got to show the weekly, like, you're on drugs AR thing. Like, dude, that's what I'm saying. If you're walking around with AR glasses and, like, this stuff's going on, like, uh, who needs acid, <laughs> right? Like, it's going it, to, it could potentially be crazy. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, the objects are, like, bubbleifying up. Uh, I, I like to show kind of some of these again, just to say how freaky this world can be if when AR becomes, like, a thing and everybody's wearing glasses and, like, wow. And finally, the LOLs of the week. Matt Comey here. <laughs> this, I literally laughed out loud at this one because I thought the same thing. Said, uh, the Big Sur icons. You see, all the, the new Big Sur icons are beautiful. Except we stopped at the QuickTime one. Says, not you. Like, look, I'll, you see QuickTime right here down at the bottom. Uh, yeah. What were you doing, QuickTime? Because I, I, I thought the same thing when I first saw that. I was like, oh, these icons are cool. And I was like, ugh, QuickTime. And then I saw this meme. Not you. Everybody's beautiful but you, QuickTime. So hopefully QuickTime icon gets a little bit of love before the uh, official Big Sur one comes out. But um, yeah, not, not, not too sure about that one. And I know I don't want to bash it. That's somebody's work. That's somebody's art. But uh, yeah, all the rest of the icons uh, are cool. Eh. All right. Finally, uh, we got one here from Dario trying to make sense of it all. Uh, this is how we feel every WWDC, right? You got the iOS developer in front and then trying to figure everything out. You just got a whole bunch of stuff thrown at you. I know for me, and I've asked this question on Twitter, I've asked this question so many times and I still don't feel like I fully grasp it. The product I'm going to create soon after my consulting uh, project is, you know, an, an iPad app slash Mac app. That's where most, it's like a, a pro app, right? I want people to use it on an iPad and a Mac. It's not really built for the phone. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, do I do Catalyst? Do I do uh, a new Swift UI app that's multi-platform? Like, because I want the best experience, right? I don't want just, yeah, the iPad app runs on a Mac. Cool. No, like I want a great Mac experience too. So you know, I kind of think I'm going to go Swift UI kit and then, or I'm sorry, Swift UI and then dive into app kit and UI kit when I need that performance. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm still confused on it. Maybe you can clear it up in the comments, but that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Swift News. Uh, we'll see you next week.